today's uh, series of uh, our Asadiki Amrut Mahotsav lecture, National Campaign on Participatory Management for Sustainable Fisheries and Biodiversity Conservation. I am going to present on the participatory management for conservation of sea horses in the Gulf of Manna and Park Bay, both places. So this is the title of this today's lecture. And uh, can you all hear me? Any, any, any? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. yes sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, the status of seahorse resources has become a major concern globally due to the decline in population. Because, uh, as you know, that there is an increasing demand for seahorses in traditional Chinese medicine. How we uh, take our traditional medicines from herbs, our indigenous uh, medicine system like Siddha and Ayurveda. In Chinese uh, system of medicine, these uh, seafoods and sea marine creatures are very much in use. So this seahorse is heavily exploited for uh, traditional Chinese medicines and uh, even seahorses are in trade for ornamental uh, display and curios. So because of this, they, they are under heavy pressure globally, a uh, seahorse population. So here, before going into further details on that, a uh, uh, book uh, prepared by Traffic NGO on the international trade on sea horses uh, tells about the Simafari work, which is, uh, states that uh, the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute in India has monitored the Tamil Nadu sea horse fishery in a systematic manner, the only fishery to be so studied. So this is the, uh, what to say, a testimonial of uh, the Simafari work, which has been started by Amanda uh, Vince, uh, of uh, Project Seahorse of Canada in her book. So, up to the ban, pre ban period, Simafari has systematically studied the Seahorse fishery and generated volumes of uh, uh, more important data for this fishery. And as far as uh, fishery, Seahorse fishery is concerned, the coast of Tamil Nadu is very important because the Gulf of Mannar and Park Bay, which is a, a rich biodiverse area and supports a large population of sea horses. Especially nine different sea horse species are reported so far from Indian waters. Until 1980s, the trade was based on the incidental catches. So before that, uh, uh, there was no targeted fishery for sea horses, only incidental intral in other fishing gear, whatever comes, they were collected, aggregated, and uh, uh, were in trade. However, because of the demands and its price uh, uh, fluctuations on the higher side, uh, the target fishing was uh, initiated in 1992 and it expanded for another five years. And when this expanded in a great way, a ban on the export of all the species of signatids came into effect by 2001 through the uh, Wildlife Protection Act. So, uh, 2001 onwards, uh, there is no legal export of sea horse from India because of its uh, listing in the uh, Wildlife Protection Act. And into this backdrop, in 2015, a project was proposed by uh, the principal investigator, Dr. K. Vinod, who is now in Calicut, uh, he is a principal scientist. So I was associating with this project as a co-PA and in this particular project, participatory management for conservation of sea horses in the Gulf of Manna, uh, which was supported by FAO and uh, the ICR Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute is the implementing partner. And this was conducted for a six months period, a short period project, and which uh, has brought uh, more details about the sea horse fishery uh, during the ban. So those details only I am going to present uh, uh, during this lecture, which will which will make us to understand how the sea horse fishery is being done in a clandestine manner and how this affects their population uh, during the ban period. So if you know, the sea horse belong to the family Signatidae, the five fishes and sea horses are coming under this family and mostly the sea horses coming under one uh, genus Hippocampus. All sea horses are marine except for some which are on estuarine and Hippocampus puda is an estuarine species and that is most common in our waters. 
and adult to see horses attract fewer predators due to the presence of unappetizing bony plaques as you most of us would have seen the bony structure and the body parts uh, so this clearly shows that they have very few natural enemies in the ecosystem so the major threat comes from outside of their ecosystem from anthropogenic activity and human intervention and human uh, fishing pressure is the major uh, reason for their dwindling population and if you look at the worldwide population of uh, species diversity of uh, seahorses the worms world database lists nearly 59 species of which 42 species are listed in the IUCN red list of threatened species and two species are coming under endangered category and 12 species are under vulnerable and 10 are under least concern and nearly 27 species are data deficient however <coughs> This particular listing is not including some of the varieties of species which are not yet uh, properly included because the taxonomy is changing. A recent work on global revision of the sea horses uh, in the genus Hippocampus uh, published in Zootaxa somewhere in 2021. This list only 41 species after carrying out the morphological and molecular methods. So this is the uh, latest uh, report on the sea horse diversity and this particular work has been submitted to conference of parties 18 uh, to list in the CITES. Uh, so uh, likewise uh, the exercise uh, of morphological and molecular uh, studies required for Indian uh, sea horse diversity also to correctly uh, delineate the species diversity. And as far as reported species diversity from Indian water is concerned, nearly nine species, Hippocampus trimaculatus, Hippocampus fuda, Hippocampus phrasus, Hippocampus phinocissimus, Hippocampus helcologi, Hippocampus barboniensis, Hippocampus hystrix, and Hippocampus mohiniki, and Hippocampus cameliopardalis. Cameo this Camellia Bardalis is uh, so far restricted to Andaman waters. And again, if you look at the taxonomy, the uh, Hippocampus barboniensis, uh, during this study period, it was uh, uh, treated as a separate species. Now, as per the recent literature, this has been uh, put it in the species complex of Hippocampus buddha. So, uh, when we compare with the Gulf of Mannar and Park Bay biodiversity, seven species are there in Gulf of Mannar and six species we have reported during this study period in Park Bay. So, this is the diversity pattern of uh, Indian sea horse uh, uh, varieties. And these are some of the photographs. So, as I already told you, the Hippocampus barboniensis, when it was treated as a separate species during the study, now as per the recent uh, literature uh, available on the 2022 basis, this particular barboniensis has been uh, put it in this Hippocampus coda species complex. So here I would like to talk about uh, some of the perspectives in the management of sea horse. So from a conservationist perspective, sea horse are threatened fishes. So concomitantly, from a socioeconomic perspective, they represent a source of income. So these are all the two opposite side of this resource management. So how to integrate these two opposing views uh, to manage it. That is the uh, toughest uh, uh, part of this management. So here, uh, to integrate these two, we have to recognize the fishers' knowledge and their ability to assist in the implementation of conservation strategy and management. So that is the first step in integrating these two opposing areas uh, for the management of sea horses. So in that time only, this particular project was formulated to understand the impact of listing and to come out with the policy guidance for conservation and management. Really, it is a tough task, isn't it? So, since it is already listed in the uh, Schedule 1, what kind of uh, policy interventions which can be uh, done and that will help and conserve the and manage the seahorse resources? Okay. So, seahorse trade from India during pre bank period. So, India and Philippines were the top resource countries uh, exporting seahorses. 
and even in 1996 winston reported nearly 85% of the seahorse trade came from park bay region so that much resource was available in park bay region and the quantity of the and value of the seahorse peaked during the 2009 that is the uh, year the ban was imposed on seahorse nearly 4 0.3 tons and nearly 2.7 million rupees worth of seahas were traded during that period so here during this study period and in park bay and gulf of manna region uh, through field investigations the main centers of seahas collections and trade were identified that starts from tondi in the park bay devi patnam mandapam kilakarai valinokam vemba and kutikori these are all important hubs for seahas trade even during the ban period so when we look at the landing in the trawl as well as in the country trawl that is called thalmadi locally and in the uh, seahas trawl the gulf of manar mean in one boat is around 4.28 in park bay it is around 5.08 and whereas if you look at the park in uh, thalumadi that is country trawl it is around 3.08 for gulf of manar and park bay it is 7.93 so by and large the park bay even during the ban period this uh, produces more sea horses through incidental catches in the uh, trawl and the thalumadi operations so when we compare this country trawl is bringing more sea horses uh, during this ban period that is uh, the sea horse uh, ban period if you look at the two species male and female uh, ratio hippocampus cuda and hippocampus trimaculatus it is somewhere around 60% and 40% 55% and 4% the sex ratio is around 1 is to 1 something like that and when we look at the male empty pouch and full pouch around 25% males were with full pouch that means that they are the brooders they will be releasing around uh, 2 lakh 50000 so it was calculated during this period when we studied so the number of males were around 64000 in that brooding males were around 60 16800 if uh, only 15 are surviving if we keep that number though they are the developing embryo numbers were 45 to 700 in hippocampus trimaculatus and 91 to 982 in hippocampus coda even if we keep 15 members survived from this brooding male it would recruit nearly 2 lakh 50000 young ones fingerlings or whatever so since it is a fish it flies into the uh, population so that much potential organism is removed during this trawl or incidental catch nearly 25% of the animals were in actively reproducing in brood brooding condition that is the most important finding of this particular study and when we look at the size range of hippocampus coda and uh, hippocampus trimaculatus in both the ecosystem gulf of manar and park bay and uh, look at the size 98 to 162 and 96 to 166 for female and zones were around actually they are uh, mature around uh, 7 to 8 cm length they mature before one year old they mostly mature and uh, if you look at that and most of them are brooding size actually what to say actively reproducing size so whatever it is so that's why nearly 25% of the population which are caught through incidental catches are actively reproducing uh, stage so if we look at the average uh, price of dried sea horses across the supply chain so here uh, this if you look at this fisherman uh, area if it is 400 to 600 counts because the price is depending on the counts if less count means more price more count means less price during the ban period and before the ban period it is compared in this particular table all this uh, particular details are available in the project report final report it is available in the sima for e prints anyone can very well refer even after this presentation also and uh, if it is 400 to 600 count it is uh, before uh, ban period it was only 3500 during the ban period that has escalated nearly four fold increase so from fisherman to exporter nearly it is more than three times increase so this is the these exporters and 
traders are the drivers of this uh, trade so because of them only this trade is continuing even during the moratorium period so the moratorium imposed by the government may be effective in conservation of stocks if illegal removals are effectively stopped so this particular trade is continuing even during the ban period so why this illegal trade continues because of these three reasons dependency on sea horses for livelihood great demand in the export market and easy to process because there is absolutely no processing only drain so sun drying is sufficient enough to keep for years together and even uh, transporting is uh, somewhat easier to understand me so people are uh, trading this illegally also in these areas park bay and gulf of manar area so socio economic survey this was carried out by a, one of the copy of this particular project uh, dr johnson in a uh, two ecosystem park bay and gulf of manar nearly 21 villages in gulf of manar and 20 villages in park bay were surveyed during this period and uh, he brought out a bar chart uh, indicating that the skin diving around 24% people are collecting through skin diving uh, even during the ban period nearly 20% uh, people uh, bringing through trawling 8% are sourcing talumadi nearly 20 29% and traders nearly 9% so when we look at that this particular skin diving is totally prohibited during this ban ban period because talumadi and trawl net these are all incidental catches which sometimes may not be possible to avoid so here this is targeted collection should be controlled so there only enforcement departments has to play a vital role uh, to remove this particular uh, percentage and here talumadi has emerged as one of the most uh, uh, damaging uh, gear especially for sea horse population nearly 29 percent it comes so if at all there is a management concern uh, management uh, step has to be taken this particular talumadi operation has to be uh, properly managed and what way sea has been affected lately how do they have uh, listed it through the severity that is called this garrett ranking by johnson this affected their standard of living that is the maximum percentage of the score that's got nearly 73 percent so this uh, shows that the people of this particular region still feel that the ban really affected their standard of living so with this perspective if we go uh, to them what are the management measures you yourself because uh, code of conduct of a responsible fishery is a voluntary conduct so fishermen were consulted what they would suggest to manage this fishery during this period so nearly uh, uh, 500 uh, uh, questionnaires i think 500 respondents were consulted and uh, if you look at that gear limitation has emerged uh, nearly 80 percent so naturally we see that the thalumadi operation uh, do great damage to the sea horse population and again the no take zone so far this particular aspect has not been fully dealt no take zone no trawl zone something like that no fishing areas so that uh, fishermen emphasize more on that particular aspect nearly 80 percent and the third aspect is that stock enhancement through sea ranging people have given 90 percent so that means um, that is the most important intervention fishers want uh, to be done in the ecosystem so uh, if we could take all these major uh, items nearly stock enhancement through sea ranging and no take zone and gear limitation there is a possibility to do all these things for the conservation of sea horse in the Park Bay and Gulf of Manar region so with this idea when we look at the recent paper on 2019 which was published by Sara et al and with Amanda Vincent who is part of the project sea horse based in Canada so they have brought out a paper on global sea horse trade and defense export so in spite of the export bans global sea horse trade continues so here on the one hand bans certainly have a place in conservation and uh, the bans can be implemented effectively so that the uh, wild population is uh, taken care of but on the other hand if uh, this only in the paper and there is no active monitoring or management of these resources so that will seriously affect the sea horse population so here so what they have finally suggested based off of this discussion after looking at the global scenario it would be far better for CITES members to manage their trade sustainably than to declare 
bands that are not implemented. So we here in India, what we see this particular situation. So a standalone ban cannot help because the argument what they say in, during their work. So a poorly managed fishery has a scope for improvement for sustainability. But when you place a standalone ban, you don't have any chance for even improve the situation. So ultimately, what happens now, you either you would not be able to sustain the population, no sea ranging or no activity could be carried out. So finally, the population in jeopardy. So that is what the outcome of this in 2019. But whereas when we completed this project and conducted 2016, the stakeholders meeting in Tutikorin, the same opinion was given four years before also. The general opinion of fisherman was that removal from a total ban to a regulated fishery. That is what their demand and seasonal closure, for example, as a seasonal closure also, only for trawls. There is no ban on country trawl, especially in this Talumadi. So that seriously affects the seahorse population. And they even suggest that there can be minimum legal sizes and already CITES has recommended uh, 10 centimeter applies. Even in CITES, it is put, the seahorse trade is put under Appendix 2. That means trade is permitted when the natural stock is sustainably managed without affecting the wild population, the trade is permitted. This is what many countries are doing. Only some 16 countries have banned, uh, total ban in their country. But other countries, uh, uh, through this particular uh, way, they trade their sea horses. So no take zones and habitat production is very well, uh, ca can be done in uh, the Gulf of Manar and Park Bay ecosystem, especially if there is a reproductive resource or uh, not allocating all the areas, only one or two islands no take zones and their habitat is protect, protect, protected and so that the restocking program something like the sea ranging programs can be carried out. So far we have not earmarked any area for sea ranging in Gulf of Mandar and Park Bay area. So such habitat production or no take zones can be very well used for uh, sea ranging activity of any of the conserv conserv conservation important species. So here only the co-management comes. So the stakeholders they can themselves involve in this kind of sea ranging program so that the co-management and uh, people participation with active participation this can be uh, implemented in the field the institutional requirement and capacity uh, development in a research institution like Simafari and other academic uh, universities are ready to provide it and uh, as far as regional cooperation is concerned that is a major issue here because we have an adjacent country Sri Lanka where the uh, laws are very different uh, FRC cucumber as well as seahorse also. The Department of Fisheries in Sri Lanka promotes penculture of uh, uh, sea cucumber in especially in Manna area, especially these are the areas most conducive for that. So since the law is very different and even for the seahorses also there is a licensed trade is there. Uh, so since this kind of different uh, law existing in the neighboring country, so the trade, clandestine trade continues. So here only the regional cooperation is very much required to contain the legal uh, traffic of these endangered species. So what are the recent conservation efforts? So this is something like a blessing in disguise. The declaration of Dr. K. K. Mohamed Koya Sea Cucumber Conservation Reserve in Lakshadweep in 2020 nearly for about 685 square kilometer. Definitely this would not only conserve sea cucumber, this will help improve the sea horse population also there. And similarly, in 2021, the government of Tamil Nadu has declared uh, about 500 square kilometer in Park Bay as Dugong Conservation Reserve. This starts from Adiran Patnam uh, in Tanjore district and ends in Amapatnam in Pudukote district, so nearly for about one kilometer from the shoreline. And uh, definitely this would also, in a similar manner, not only would protect Dugong, because this particular 500 square kilometer area, nearly 80% of this area is covered by seagrass. 
So that's a rich sea grass meadows are conducive area for sea horse population to thrive. So in that way, so when we conserve a particular species, another species also is taken care of in that particular ecosystem. This kind of recent conservation efforts of the government of Tamil Nadu and uh, as well as the government of uh, Indian Territory of Lakshadweep also would greatly help the sea horse population to revive and survive in those ecosystems. And with that, I uh, finish my presentation. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you.